These are the top 10 innocent people who are locked away for life. At number 10, we have Lydia Diane Jones. Lydia moved in with her parents in 1997, and her boyfriend, Ronnie Cook, moved into her old home. Ronnie began selling substances from that home. On December 10th, 1997, Lydia went to her old home to pick up clothes that she left there. When federal and local law enforcement raided the home, they found all the substances Ronnie was selling and arrested him. Jones went to trial in October 2000, and by that time, Ronnie was charged but came to an agreement to testify against other substance sellers. Cook was supposed to be called during the trial to testify that he owned the substances in the house at the time of the raid, but prosecutors told his lawyers, which he shared with Lydia, that if he testified, Testified, they would file state charges against him. As a result, he was not called as a witness, and Lydia took the fall. She spent six years in prison before getting help from the Equal Justice Initiative and having her charges dismissed on August 17, 2006. Coming in at number nine, we have Walter McMillian. In 1986, an 18 year old white woman by the name of Rhonda Morrison was executed in downtown Monroeville, Alabama and police couldn't solve the crime. After six months with no leads or suspects, they turned their attention to McMillian, who was an unlikely suspect with no prior criminal history. A white man who was accused of crimes in another county was pressured by police to make false statements about McMillian, accusing him of taking the life of Miss Morrison. Walter was arrested by Monroe County Sheriff Tom Tate, who arranged for Walter to be placed on deceased row before the trial when he wasn't even convicted of any crimes. McMillian spent a horrifying 15 months on Alabama deceased row before his trial. Walter McMillian was 11 miles away from the scene of the crime when it occurred, which dozens of black people testified, but the nearly all white jury sentenced him to life in prison without parole. The judge overrode the sentencing and actually sentenced him to execution by electric chair. McMillian spent six more years on deceased row before he was released in March of 1993. At number eight, we have Walter Forbes. On July 12th, 1982, Dennis Hall passed away in an apparent arson at his apartment. Prior to this, Hall was involved in an altercation at a bar, which was broken up by a college student, Walter Forbes. The day after the fight, Hall shot Forbes, which required some time to recover from. Due to two incidents happening recently, police arrested Forbes. After apparently failing a polygraph test, he was charged with felony and arson. In May 1983, they went to trial, and a woman gave testimony of apparently seeing Forbes, along with two other men, with red gasoline cans, and talking about lighting the apartment on fire. In August 1983, Forbes was sentenced to life in prison with no parole. During an evidentiary hearing in 2020, the same woman who testified revealed that it was all a lie and that Walter Forbes did nothing. On November 20th, 2020, 37 years and some change later, Walter Forbes walked free. At number seven, we have Muhammad Aziz and Khalil Islam. On February 21st, 1965, just after 3 p.m., Malcolm X was giving a speech at the Autobahn Ballroom on 165th Street in Broadway. When the crowd was disrupted, something about a pickpocket. Malcolm X tried to calm the situation when one man rushed the stage with a weapon and shot him. Malcolm fell backwards and two other men rushed the stage with another weapon and shot him again. One of the men was captured by the crowd and security detail until police arrived to arrest him. The other two assailants escaped. The FBI then assisted the New York Police Department in finding the perpetrators and identified them as Muhammad Aziz and Khalil Islam. Based on witness interviews and other information, there was no physical or forensic evidence of either of them connecting them to the passings. They were both convicted of execution and sent to prison on March 11th, 1966. And a month later, they were sentenced to life in prison. Aziz was released from prison on June 24th, 1985, and Islam was released on February 10th, 1987. At number six, we have Richard Phillips. Richard Phillips was 25 years old when he was imprisoned for a fatal shooting in Detroit in 1971, along with another individual, Richard Palombo, as his accomplice. Prosecutors now say that it was based in entirely on false testimonies from one witness. He was sentenced to life without parole. Two days after he was sentenced, he wrote a poem about the things he wondered about now that he had plenty of time to think. Appeals in 1974 and 1975 both failed, while in prison, Phillips witnessed many horrific things involving inmates. After years and years of working in prison for just $100 a month, he began drawing and sent money out for an acrylic paint set. But what came back was a watercolor sketch set. He made do with what he had and began making watercolors to stave off the loneliness. Phillips painted every day, so much so that he had to send his paintings to a pen pal in New York, or the guards would confiscate them. On October 20th, 2009, Richard was given a public hearing. He once again insisted he was innocent, 
but heard nothing back from his appeal. After all this time, guilt had been stirring in Richard Palombo. He admitted in 2010 that Phillips had nothing to do with the crime. It took seven more years for Richard Phillips to be free. At number five, we have Joyce Ann Brown. On May 6, 1980, two armed women robbed fine furs by Reuben Danzinger in Dallas, Texas. The owner was shot and unfortunately passed away, but his wife was spared due to her lying and saying she had cancer. The women left the store and drove off in a brown 1980 Datsun. The car was found the next day and police learned it was a rental under the name of Joyce Ann Brown. And after reading the news on May 8th, Joyce learned that she was a suspect and turned herself in, which led to her being charged with the crime. A different woman by the name of Joyce Ann Brown from Denver, Colorado was interviewed by the police and told them she lent the car to a friend and never heard from the friend or the car again. The friend was then identified as Michelle Renee Taylor. Joyce Ann Brown from Dallas was convicted by a jury on October 23rd, 1980 of taking someone's life in aggravated robbery. Ten months after the robbery, Taylor was arrested in Michigan for shoplifting and sent back to Dallas. In October 1981, she pled guilty and swore an affidavit that Brown was not her accomplice. Brown was released on November 3rd, 1989. At number four, we have Gloria Killian. In December 1981, two men dressed as telephone repairmen entered the home of an elderly couple, shooting them both and stealing six suitcases of silver. An anonymous call led to the arrest of Gary Mass, one of the perpetrators. Mass's wife told the police that a woman named Gloria was the mastermind behind the whole operation. Gloria Killian was initially arrested, but charges were dropped after the preliminary hearing. Mass struck a deal with the Sacramento Sheriff to expose those who were involved, and he explained that Gloria Killian did in fact help. Killian was re-arrested and tried. She was sentenced to 32 years to life in prison, and Mass admitted later that she had nothing to do with the crime, and her conviction was overturned in August 2002. Coming in at number three, we have Jeffrey Scott Hornoff. In August 1989, Victoria Cushman was executed in her apartment in Rhode Island. Hornoff was an early suspect because of his relationship with the victim. Jeffrey wasn't arrested until 1994, however, after political pressure led to Rhode Island Attorney General transferring the case to state police. No physical evidence or witnesses placed Hornoff at the crime scene, but he was convicted in 1996 by a jury. He sent many appeals from prison, all being denied. And in November 2002, a former boyfriend of Cushman confessed to the crime and Hornoff was released. Next, at number two, we have Lamar Johnson. In 2004, a man by the name of Carl Carlos Sawyer had his life taken in broad daylight and a few hours later a 911 tip was given saying the perpetrator went by Boo Boo as a nickname. The police followed the nickname's trace and it led them to Lamar Johnson. Eyewitnesses claimed Johnson looked like the shooter and he went to trial and was found guilty and sentenced to life in prison. After an appeal from Johnson in 2008, a team got to work on his case, revisiting the crime scene and retesting physical evidence. They found several eyewitnesses that were previously seen as unimportant and on September 17th, 2017, Lamar Johnson's case was reviewed in a writ of actual innocence hearing and was released from prison soon after. Finally, at number one, we have Ricky Jackson. Ricky was actually sentenced to pass away in Cleveland, Ohio for the execution of Harold Franks. Franks was doing business outside of a convenience store when a couple of people splashed him with acid, clubbed him, shot him several times, and stole money off of him before getting away. Detectives received a statement from a 12-year-old paperboy, Eddie Vernon, who knew Ricky Jackson and his friends, and pinned the crime on them even though his classmates said Eddie was no nowhere near the crime scene. Jackson is said to have served the longest prison sentence of any U.S. inmate who was found innocent.